Powered by Ford. For Hack 5, I'm Darren Kitchen here at CES 2012, and I just found the internet. How are you, John? I'm doing good. Good to be here. So, Aaron, for the audience that doesn't know, what is Aaron? Sure. Aaron's the American Registry for Internet Numbers. It is the, uh, the organization that keeps track of all the IP addresses that people use every day to connect things to the internet. Everything on the internet has an IP address. Aaron is one of the five regional registries, the original one, that's responsible for keeping track of all the numbers so that internet service providers can connect up new customers. So there's Aaron in the U.S. or North America. There's RIPA across the street. Yep. And then who are the other two? Okay. So it's Aaron, RIPE for Europe, RIPE NCC. It's APNIC in Asia Pacific. Originally, Latin America and Africa were part of the Aran region when we were founded, but they actually self-organized and we actually broke them out. So we now have LACNIC for Latin America and AFRANIC for Africa. So it's five regional internet registries. Every ISP, everybody who connects people to the internet, hosting company, ISP, has to be a member of one of the registries to get new IP addresses. So did you bring all the IP addresses to the booth? I mean, what products are you showing off? Well, for security reasons, I can't say where we keep them. But obviously, they're, they're, they're caged, though. You keep the IP4ones in a cage. Well, the IP4ones are very small. We can keep them in back. But IPv6, with 340 undecillion, 340 trillion, trillion, trillion. You just made that. He just made that up. We, Don't listen to him. Not, we did not bring that many. But we're actually here at the show to talk to people and let them know that indeed the number of IPv4 addresses is fixed and we're running out. Oh no, is this going to be another one of those stories where set your hair on fire because we're about to run out? Yes, absolutely, yes. It is going to be one of those stories, but it's a true story. We actually knew back in 1992-93 that we were going to run out. We did forecasts in the IETF. But, but that's when we got NAT, so everything's perfect again. Let's oh. just NAT everything. Actually, so what happened is we knew, remember 92-93, pre-NAT, pre-World Wide Web. Just email and telnet. Remember telnet? Uh, I still use it. Before SSH, right. Yeah. So email, telnet, and FTP, we were growing so fast that the IETF did extrapolation and said, wow, in 2010, we're going to run out. Big problem. So we formed a working group, and we said, we got to do the successor, because 2 to the 32nd power is not enough. 4.3 billion addresses wasn't going to cut out. So we did a new protocol, IPv6. And we got it standardized in 1999, got code to Berkeley, remember BSD, got code to Berkeley, Linux, Apple, uh, got it in Windows, so everything supports it, we just have to turn it on now. Okay, so why aren't we all just using it right now? Why didn't we just give up on IPv4 last year? Well, so right now in, the, in this region, we still have IPv4 addresses. Service providers come to us and get their next block of addresses and use it to connect their next 10,000, 20,000 customers. Why change? It works. Yeah, no joke, I actually want to own an IPv4 so that I can like give it to my kids one day, exactly. you know, because I'm imagining it'll probably still work in 40 years. Uh, may, who knows? I mean, SNA might work, X25 might work, DECnet might work. Ho host name dot whatever. Exactly, host name dot text. So the fact is that we're in transition, but right now, people who are already connected to the internet are connected with IPv4, and they don't have to worry. But to connect new customers in Asia Pacific, they are no longer have generally available IPv4 addresses. They have no choice but to use IPv6 if they want to connect something to the internet. So is that just a standard in like the commercial routers that you'll find in those regions? Right. Actually, everyone supports it. All the commercial equipment here for networks and firewalls all support it, but they've actually turned it on. And they're using it to connect home gateways, wireless equipment. Now, when they go to your website, your website's only running IPv4 because you have an upgrade. But then that's why we have IPv6 to IP4 and, and vice versa. Well, so someone who's connecting customers up with IPv6 will have a gateway to get to you old things that are only on the old internet, like your website. So it might work, but don't ask me how the audio video streaming will work. So don't ask me if your payment will work. So what's happened is that a lot of the content providers that we thought didn't care about this because they're already connected, are now paying a lot of attention, and they're actually some of the first ones to test out IPv6. Funny how that happens when dollar signs get involved. So now, speaking of dollar signs, one, can I even still buy an IPv4 address? And two, can I buy some IPv6 loving, and how much is that going to cost? Okay, so we actually give out addresses to people who need them, 
and we still have IPv4 addresses. If you apply and you need them, we'll issue them. We charge a fee for administration, but it's not buying and selling an IP address. It's just to do the processing of the application. That, that doesn't sound like supply and demand. It's not, actually. It's not with V4. Now, that is changing. Remember, in the old days, these addresses were given out just for an email message. Send an email message, you get mailed back. Yeah, I'd like a Class C, please. Exactly. Now we actually say you have to be a network operator. You have to have use of it. And in fact, the old numbers that were issued in the old days that people aren't using, we've provided a limited mechanism for them to transfer them to someone else and get paid for it. So there is an emerging market in V4. Wow. To, M MIT could make a boatload. Except the fact is that a lot of people feel they have a lot of need for those. Even the existing companies are thinking cloud computing, virtual machines, they're holding on to them. Even with everything we do though, there's only 4.3 billion IPv4 addresses, okay? Seven billion people on the planet. Everyone has a smartphone or wants one. That's more than we have addresses. Wait, you want a home computer? That needs an address. Now we're 14 billion. You have any computers at work? Well, now we're 20 billion. Yeah, it goes on and on and on. Is IP6 gonna be enough? 340 undecillion, 340 universes, where each universe can have a, uh, a, a 340 trillion universes, where each universe can have a trillion networks and each network can have a trillion devices. So hopefully we're only gonna go through this once. So you hear that? We're good until the singularity. That's right, once we switch to V6. Now I tell the content companies have paid a lot of attention. Last year on June 8th, a lot of the big content companies, Google, Yahoo, Bing, all turned on IPv6 for their major websites, their production public website, to make sure that people could access it without having any side effects, and it worked out very well. Okay, so now that there's actually some companies that are providing some content on IP6, how do the consumers go and get an address? Do they go to you, do they go to their ISP, how does that work? Their existing companies, existing consumers who are connected via V4 are fine, and they can continue to use V4. They're getting to the same content. HTTP, whether it's over V4 or V6, is the same HTTP. Okay, it's businesses that need to contact their service provider and say, I'm running a website, I want to make that available via V6 in addition to V4. If you're a small or medium business, talk to your ISP and say, I want to offer my content. You have a website so you can get to the whole internet, right? Yeah. That no longer is a V4 only website. Yeah, you just get another uh, A record, basically. You get another A record and your routers are configured and your firewall is configured and you get requests from either service. If you don't do that, as more customers, think about it this way, as a circle. We are filling the IPv4 circle and it's getting pretty full. We're starting to add customers with V6 outside that circle. If you don't upgrade your website, you're only talking to people in the smaller circle. All right, that's awesome. Thank you so much, Sean. It's Thank been a real pleasure. Much. And uh, yeah, yeah. feel free to hit me up on FidoNet anytime. Exactly. For continued coverage of CES 2012, go ahead and head over to revision3.com slash CES. And of course, we'd like to thank Ford for powering our coverage. Brake Coach, found in the Ford Focus EV's instrument cluster, allows you to optimize your usage of the car's regenerative brakes. It displays a graphic that shows how much energy is captured each time you stop so that you can make adjustments to maximize your range. Thanks to Ford for powering our CES coverage.